thank you, Ron, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I, I hope I'll be able to enlighten you about a subject which has, you know, after the, over the last six to nine months, been thrust into everybody's consciousness, consciousnesses, and and into everybody's living rooms on a regular basis. Uh, namely, the development of a vaccine for for COVID nineteen. I hope to give you some insights that sort of exactly as Ron sets this up is is about the science first because that really is the only thing that stands between us and success in conquering uh conquering COVID-19 and interestingly at the present time the science says wear your mask wash your hands regularly and social distance because that is the most impactful way of stopping yourself from get, get, uh, getting COVID-19. And I just want to, you know, it's often forget forgotten because we're always at the cutting edge of science and there's so much being done and so much new and so much optimism. We have to remember that in the, in the 1800s, the thing that stopped a cholera pandemic in London was simply turning off the contaminated water supply. And that was the famous Golden Square experiment uh, done by Dr. Snow at that time. I don't even know if he was a doctor, but he just found out that most of the cases of cholera at that time, you, you guys, a lot of you have been to London. It's a very advanced, techie city. But a couple of hundred years ago, there was a lot of cholera. And he just identified that there was a key water pump in the middle of one of these beautiful squares in London, Golden Square that was contaminated with cholera and all the cases were were caused by it. It took him months to get through the political system to turn the water pump off. Now, at that time, no one even knew what the cholera bacteria looked like. No one knew what vaccines really did. No one knew anything. But once he turned that water pump off, the cholera pandemic in London or the cholera epidemic in London stopped. Now, the other very instructional piece of this story is how long do you think it took Parliament to act and do anything about cholera in London? Years and years. And it wasn't until the stink, the so-called great stink of London, because all of the sewage was running through the water supply of London into the River Thames. And that was flowing along, as all of you have been to London know, the Houses of Parliament are right on the Thames. And the so-called and famous or infamous great stink occurred and the politicians were suddenly struck dumb by the fact that what had been detected several years before in golden square that the sewage water was contaminating the or the, the water that was being drunk was actually running through the thames that they then acted and enacted a massive sewage system to be built in London, which actually has lasted, much of it has lasted even to this day. So there's a lesson there in terms of the simple measures that we resist and make fun of and, oh, who's wearing this mask and that mask and that actually make a difference. And then how long it actually takes government to do anything about it. So I just want to highlight that because in the, in the vaccine era, even though we're now being inundated in our living rooms about COVID-19 and we think, wow, this is incredibly cutting edge. We've got to deal with it in a cutting edge way. Well, the truth is some of the most basic measures we take now will have some huge impacts on, on whether we uh, succeed in reducing the mortality rate uh, and the overall death rate uh, caused by this disease or not. We have to always bear that in mind. What you guys do who are on the phone with regards to these simple infection control measures in your homes and your businesses will make a great deal of difference now. They made a great different deal of difference over the, six, the last six to nine months. I'm just going to very briefly, um, if I can get to change my slides, we talked about it, just quickly uh, talk about what I do, just so you understand where I'm coming from. I run a a, a large center at Mass General Hospital. It accelerates the development of vaccines and immunotherapies uh, for infections, cancer, and immune-mediated diseases like type 1 diabetes, 
We focus on safe, cost-effective, broadly applicable solutions for unmet medical needs. COVID-19 is obviously one of them. And then below is the model. Uh, importantly, pot potentially, is that we use distributed development. We collaborate with people all over the world to make sure that we're doing the right thing and also executing on complex consortium-based experiments. So we're not doing all the experiments here. We're doing them with collaborators all over the world. We also have a, a diversified funding portfolio involving grants, contracts, and philanthropy, which is frankly the only way to sustain uh, translational research centers at the moment because of the various shortfalls in any one of those. Uh, we have uh, nine products in development. We've spun off four or five, uh, well, most recently five biotech companies from our center uh, based in an academic center. And as you can see in the middle of this, uh, we have a self-assembled vaccine under development for COVID-19. And the same basic model is being used for a, for a human papillomavirus or HPV-related cancer vaccine as well. And when it says partnered, it's either partnered with industry, governmental organizations like the Department of Defense, or philanthropic organizations like the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. The, the, these are the names of some of the companies that we work with on, on the left side of the companies we founded and then on the right side of the companies that we work with on these technologies. The biggest <clears throat> issue, just as you know, with COVID-19 is getting to, something from the, from the be, uh, bench top of the lab all the way to the bedside as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. And that cannot be understated in the context of vaccines, because in the history of vaccines, it is littered with stories of vaccines that went all the way to phase three and then failed subsequently, or failed in phase three after careful examination of both the safety and efficacy of those vaccines. Some vaccines have, have had significant safety issues. The, the H1N1 vaccine, the initial uh, product uh, caused narcolepsy. That's where people uh, dramatically fall asleep regularly multiple times a day without really even being aware of it. What That was this, one of the side effects of the so-called swine flu vaccine, led to modifications that caused the vaccine to be delayed in release here in the, in the US by several months. So there, there are real safety issues and then efficacy issues. Every time we we get a flu vaccination, we have to be aware of a maybe a 30 to 40 percent efficacy, which is even lower in elderly people or with people who are less, uh, their immune systems are less competent. So that these issues of transferring technology to industry safely to make a safe and effective product is a very, very important issue and never more important and when you're thinking about a vaccine for hundreds of millions of people, and remember, remembering that vaccines are given to healthy people. So the safety profile on giving a medicine to a healthy person is a whole lot different from giving a vaccine, let's say a cancer vaccine, to someone with a, uh, with a cancer where the average mortality uh, after that vaccine may be six months. So that issue of safety is extremely important. Now here's the target, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. You can look at that. And I mean, as a scientist, I look at it and bloody marvel at it. It really consists of five core proteins and uh, a coding sequence in a, in a particle, you know, a thousand times thinner or wider than a human hair. And that has caused the disruption that we see around the globe. What you're looking up there on the slide is what has disrupted uh, the economies, the social lives, the spiritual lives, and everything else. It doesn't have an ego. It doesn't think. It doesn't have opinions. It doesn't come from a specific country. It's a virus. And I think the point is that as a scientist, getting all of those things out of the picture make it much more straightforward to think how to target it. The other thing about viruses that everyone should know is they've been around for 1.5 billion years on this planet. 
They've been infecting bacteria, mushrooms, fish, cats, dogs, bats, and in the recent few millennia or millions of years, humans and our relatives, the chimpanzees and gorillas. So they've been around a long time. Coronaviruses have been a long time in development, in their own development, their own research and development uh, up until this point uh, coming into humans. And the important point about this particular image to those listening here is this is not a sitting target waiting for a product from Pfizer or some other company to knock it off its, off its perch. This virus and this family of viruses has taken on other living organisms successfully for, as I said, at least multiple hundreds of millions of years. So um, we have to come at this task of building a vaccine with significant humility. In some ways, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is better designed than we are for what it needs to do, which is replicate into vast numbers and spread around the globe. It took us millions of years to get off the coast or the, get out of Central Africa and move to the coastlines and get a, get, get, get a purchase around the globe. As you can see with SARS-CoV-2, with the help of all of uh, the various transport mechanisms, it did that probably in a few months. So let's, let's approach this as we develop a vaccine uh, with humility and particularly with regards to the way that our immune response reacts to viruses. That point about a virus not being a sitting duck, we know viruses engage the immune system, our incredibly sophisticated and elegant immune system on multiple fronts. And I would just stress that um, this virus is uh, uh, somewhat genomically a little bit bigger than HIV. And as you know, HIV has been around at pandemic levels for decades, and we still don't have an effective vaccine for it. So that, that's what I mean about the humility uh, with regards to looking at this virus and working out whether we can develop a safe and effective uh, vaccine to it. The optimistic human component about it is we have a highly sophisticated brain at the top of our anatomical structure, which is taking on this virus in multiply uh, intelligent manners uh, based on our scientific ability. So we do have one significant advantage here is our intellect at most of the levels at which it operates, including the scientific, op uh, scientific uh, level. And we need to use that to the best of our purposes in order to overcome this, this particular pathogen. Just a few things in general about the, 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 uh, the virus alone that makes you kind of realize this is complicated. During the first surge in Boston, uh, I was working in the intensive care units as an infectious diseases uh, physician, which I am otherwise doing you know, 20 percent of my year. And this disease presents in multiple different ways. Uh, patients presented with everything from skin complaints to meningitis type complaints, gastric complaints, lung complaints that we all know about, uh, symptoms like not being able to smell things, which is right at the junction of your brain and your nose. This, this virus impacts multiple levels of your body. So it's complicated. The other thing that it does, it it's also engages your immune system. One of the interesting things that we saw was the patients who had the lowest lymphocyte count, called here lymphopenia, was associated with the most serious types of infection. And in some cases, as the lymphocyte count started to come back up again after acute infection, we could see the patients improving. I, I'm not making a direct link about it, but if anyone wants to know whether COVID-19 engages your immune system actively, you have to look at the fact that these patients came in with very low lymphocyte counts when they had the acute infection. So something is clearly engaged here. And then the other important thing that informs vaccine development is the patients who were seriously ill did have neutralizing antibodies to the virus. That gives you pause and makes you think about 
what a vaccine needs to do. There are great uh, points of encouraging news. There's uh, around the Moderna vaccine, around the um, uh, Oxford vaccine, Pfizer, you name it. There's, there's encouraging news. A lot of these uh, vaccines generate antibodies. Some of them generate um, immunity amongst the other cells uh, that are helpful in eradicating the virus. But in terms of vaccine development, it's still relatively early days. And that's why uh, many have said in the leadership uh, that, that are informed and intelligently by science that this will be middle of next year before we really are sure that we have something that may be, may be safe and effective to roll out into the general population. And that, that's the truth of it. Now, that I, I just want to highlight another important historical point here, which is easily forgotten. When um, the famous, another famous British story, story, you'll think that I'm my British accent and my Anglophilia is sort of like warping my behavior and, uh, and discussion here. But it, the true story is that Edward Jenner, you know, a, a doctor in, in the 1700s noted that um, milkmaids who got the, the pox virus from cows by milking cows were generally resistant to smallpox, which at the time in 1700s killed four out of 10 people it infected. That's a hell of a, hell of a disease, as you can imagine. And as you know, it wiped out a good proportion of the Native American population when it was introduced into North America. So it's a deadly virus. And the other interesting US uh, story here is that George Washington himself, General George Washington, actually vaccinated the, the, uh, his army against smallpox, realizing that smallpox amongst you know, highly congregated soldiers would otherwise be more likely to be wiped out by an infection than the British army at that time. And it's a very famous story showing the insight of both a military, of a great military leader to protect his troops from that point of view. But the point is, Jenner came up with a smallpox vaccine before viruses had even been discovered. And we knew he knew nothing about immunology. And by good grace and good observation, he came up with an effective vaccine that reduced the mortality from four out of a uh, sorry, 40 out of 100 to one in over a thousand or two thousand. As I said, the vaccine history says to us there that one might get lucky even in the absence of knowledge about immunology and virology. And I think there is an element of luck in what is going forward here with regard and, and luck and good science going forward with the warp speed viruses and the data that's been generated and the knowledge of immunology and virology that makes us optimistic that it's perhaps one or two of the warp speed uh, vaccines, which are all fundamentally similar, um, uh, may actually conquer and help conquer uh, this, uh, this disease and reduce the rate of transmission, the rate of severity of the disease effectively once it gets introduced. Uh, there are, there are uh, important timelines here, which unfortunately are somewhat being, are going to be missed, which is uh, counter the current uh, COVID-19 resurgence, we would have needed a vaccine about 10 million doses now coming into this month that would save lives. Because by the time we get to March 2021, 100 million uh, doses would be needed to, to make have that impact. Um, the other thing which is highlighted by the sort of history I'm talking about in vaccine development, vaccines tend to take time Large-scale manufacture has not been done under abbreviated timelines. And as you know, a vast amount of money has been put in to make large-scale vaccines even before they've been shown to be safe and efficacious in order to crunch that timeline down. That, that is the right thing to do, but we do have to understand we don't know that any of those candidate vaccines that have been made in the tens of millions of doses will actually make an impact on the disease, but it's a risk worth taking. And, and this other point, which, you know, we can blithely say as doctors, well, 
the vaccine industry is slow and careful. The reason it's slow and careful is because the point that I made that vaccines can have adverse effects and you have to demonstrate that your vaccine is safe as well as being efficacious. And then ultimately there was a position statement released uh, by industry and interagency U US government um, regarding the, the metrics of safety and efficacy that would have to be observed on any of the current warp speed vaccines before they would be rolled out in the into the population in general. And I think that that's, you know, there's all the smoke and mirrors of whatever else goes on, but that, that uh, position statement is worth reading because that's the fundamental point about rolling out a safe and efficacious vaccine uh, as opposed to just rolling out something, which is clearly not something that, that uh, physicians and, and healthcare workers want to do uh, without it having been proven to be safe and efficacious. This is just a useful uh, graph on what it means uh, to uh, uh, control a pandemic uh, when you're coming in with a vaccine, uh, the number of doses. If you see in red there, that is what a pandemic peak over, look, over the whole world and country looks like. Then an early stage vaccine, uh, which we've missed that time point, uh, with 10 million doses would have flattened the curve. Uh, if we can get it, uh, uh, what would be the next stage, the vaccine B, we could uh, generate a, uh, certainly flatten the curve down to a green curve. And as you can see, with if we get to vaccine C or vaccine D, which are these later uh, constructions, you can see the minimal effect on the pandemic because effectively the pandemic is beginning to decline, having infected you know, the overall majority of the population. So you can see timing of when the vaccine is released is really significant. Uh, five companies with vaccines, they're all targeting the spike protein. Uh, the scientific um, point on this is that that's the protein that the virus, if you remember the diagram, I should have sort of pointed it out, holds out as the thing right on its surface. Uh, we do know that spike proteins can be loaded with things that actually evade the immune system. It's sort of like come hither and direct your antibody against this because frankly that doesn't do anything to me and uh, you know viruses have evolved un under the pressure of immune systems just like this virus would have evolved in bats to have evaded their perfectly adequate immune system so the fact that all of these vaccines are targeting spike protein while it's a jolly good target and got clear um, you know, evident immunogenic targets on it, we're not yet 100% sure whether there's going to be the type of protection elicited from those antibodies or even the uh, other immune cell responses that would actually make it protected. So I think that we're all, I, I think it's been said well, we all hope that these constructs will work. We, on the, on the principles of that, principles of vaccinology alone, we should be optimistic. There's no reason not to, but we should have in our mind the importance of creating a second generation of vaccines. And as you know, there are something like 190 other platforms in preparation. We have our own here at, at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center that is funded by a new co called Voltron Therapeutics. And we, are, we consider ourselves a second uh, generation vaccine which targets more than just the spike protein because we do think that the second gen vaccines must broaden the attack on the virus beyond the spike protein. This is where the you know the coronavirus vaccine tracker is it could be updated further uh, very soon. Um, we know that there was a halt on AstraZeneca in the UK because of a case of transverse myelitis, which is a inflammatory disease of the spinal cord. And that hold is still on in the US. They haven't released the hold. And I think one of the other, I think Innovio was also put on hold for some reasons, which I, I've been reading literature, I haven't found it out exactly why. I would encourage those who are interested in 
this sort of vaccine tracker to look into the detail of the science. If you want to follow any of these things, it's all in the science, whether these things have a chance of progressing forward or not, because it's that data that's being generated which will inform whether something is going to be successful in the fall and make it all the way to final approval. Um, I think this slide is just to highlight that the virus is also changing in its own right. It's, this is another element of it that, um, that tells you that this is not a sitting duck. It's a moving target. It's a slowly moving target. It's not like HIV that changes in every generation. This changes over a, a much longer period of time. But because there's so many infections going on, that rate is slightly faster than the normal basal rate of a coronavirus. This, you know, the gazillion viruses being produced and its error rate then is magnified because of that. And here's just in orange is one variant and in blue is another variant. These haven't been shown to be any different with regards to the way they infect cells or cause disease. But it's just an image of change that's occurring over a few months in the context of um, uh, of a virus that does have the capacity to change. Um, there are open questions that are really important. Uh, it, uh, I think this is not just been described by me, but others that we're building a, a vaccine at you know, warp speed while we're laying the tracks at the same time. We're building the train, we're moving along the tracks, we're building the tracks at the same time. And uh, the truth of it is there are questions being answered now and have been since warp speed got initiated that uh, may actually imp impose um, new controls on the second generation vaccines because got what we're learning about the immunology the durability of immunity and so forth um, could actually impact the second generation vaccine design and development but could also impact the uh, understanding of the efficacy and potentially even the safety of those uh, vaccines going forward. So we are, there are a lot of open questions that are being filled as rapidly as the scientists can. We, uh, I, I put up this slide just to say, to make this point, I, I don't want to run, I'll just finish very shortly, which is that over 10 years ago, we were funded by DARPA at DOD to develop a vaccinate pandemic vaccine, um, which could be assembled rapidly from the emergence of a viral pathogen, be tested in 180 days and get into human studies within that time. We're currently on that type of timetable. But what that story tells the audience is that the government agencies, particularly the DOD, has been aware of the potential coming pandemic for decades and actually put in place some very elegant systems for surveying the environment for approaching pandemic viruses, which were dismantled in 2018. But I want to make it clear that pandemics have been with the human race for millennia. Uh, there were scientifically, people have been aware of them for decades. And over the last two decades, scientists and government agencies had been aware that it was important to be able to rapidly put vaccines together and I feel very fortunate indeed to lead a team here at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Centre to actually see if we can come up with a safe and effective second generation vaccine. I'm going to bypass the, these slides and just go on to my last but one slide. All that we do is based on a collaboration between academia, US government, industry and philanthropy. All four play a role in making the impossible poss possible. Dropping out one of these makes us significantly weaker, any one of these. And, and the challenge at the moment is so great that those four components working in society together are absolutely central to our success. I'll leave that point at that. And then just go back to this point, take home messages, Keep it simple. COVID-19 vaccine is on its way, safety and efficacy first. It's got to be a science and data informed decision making process. That's key to this uh, so that we, one, don't mislead the public or 
worse actually harm the public. We only want to make the public safe and healthy. And in the meantime, testing, symptom attestation, mask wearing, social distancing, and hand washing are absolutely crucial to the control of COVID-19 in this country and, and, on, uh, uh, and on the planet as a whole. And with that knowledge, I'm hoping that I'm passing on a little bit or with a little bit of this knowledge, because I, I'm no way definitive on everything about vaccine development here. This knowledge, part of it and so forth, is power in the context of dealing with a pandemic. As much, of, as, much as turning off that walk, contaminated water pump in the square in London was all those hundreds of years ago. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you today. I thank for, to Ron for giving me the opportunity and happy to um, answer questions by you know, uh, the internet or email or whatever. Thank you very much.